So welcome and thank you everybody for coming. This is our fifth podcasting Skillshare. I can't believe it's the fifth one already, a part of SCAN Storyteller Collective. And for those of you who are not familiar with SCAN, it's, uh, it stands for Scottish Communities Climate Action Network. And we are here to support community-led action to address the climate and end nature emergency and to work for a just, thriving and resilient Scotland because who wouldn't want to? Um, and we're a membership organization uh, for both organizations as, as, uh, as well as individuals. So if you're not a member yet, please do consider joining It's free. Uh, and it's a grand, great bunch of people and great resources um, uh, that we offer for people that are working in climate action. Um, and I work as a uh, Scan Story Weaver with my colleague, uh, Joanna, who's also here today. And as part of Story Weaver role, and in recognition of the power of stories to bring social change, we are working to support SCAN Storyteller Collective. And this Storyteller Collective is fairly nebulous and loose um, association of people. Um, those who are uh, using that, we're trying to bring together those who are using their creativity to amplify stories, real or imaginary of the future worth fighting for um, uh, to, help inspire our communities around Scotland for action. So um, we would like these stories to, re to come from as many people as possible, whether we, you are an experienced storyteller or whether you are a community activist or um, a leader of an organization, we want voices from all walks of life uh, and we want to reach as many corners of Scotland as possible. So trying to bring these voices out um, and showcase the future that we're working for and um, in help, to help showcase the stories, we have 1,000 Better Stories podcast and blog, and we welcome contributions in a variety of story formats to both of these. And we even have mini grants to, for anyone who would like to make a contribution to either of these spaces. Uh, and if you're interested in, in that funding, which we offer until the end of March, but probably ex extended beyond that later, um, please stay back and we're happy to tell you uh, about it later on. And all the information is on Scan Storyteller Collective page and um, John has been sharing all the links in the chat. So feel free to click on these. And obviously I'm gonna include all the links in the follow-up email as well. So if you've lost anything um, during the session, that's where you can find it. So um, we hear uh, as part of the podcasting Skillshare series, which um, we um, run to bring together all the people who are already involved in um, podcasting around climate change, and also maybe to bring some new people on board and build sort of build our skills together and build a community together to help us tell stories. But we also um, run longer workshops on storytelling for social change, and the next two months are amazing there's lots of stuff coming up so please do check out check out our scan eventbrite channel which has got all the workshop listed in there and today's skillshare is slightly departing from the you know typical focus of on podcasting um, and um, uh, we invited um, um, Alette um, to talk uh, about uh, who is a, a performance storyteller author author, teacher, and researcher. I'm just reading out the blurb from your, <laughs> from your uh, website, Alette, um, who works with stories and people to transform the world into one where every being can thrive. And it's beautifully aligns with our mission in a storytelling collective, surprise, surprise. And I found, about, found out about the reason that we invited Alette to the podcasting uh, Skillshare is because everybody needs to know how to use, you know, in whatever medium you work in, it's relevant to know how to use stories for, uh, for change. And um, also because I was inspired by her podcast, Restoring the Earth, uh, which she recorded, where the, she recorded all the interviews with storytellers from around the world. So it was very inspiring. Um, um, lots of ideas, lots of amazing people working in this field. So I would recommend everybody checks it out. But, Without further ado, I'm going to hand over to Alette and let's and she's going to lead us through the magic of storytelling in an interactive fashion, I believe. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Um, I'm really pleased to see you all today. I'm here from my home in Edinburgh, where it is sunny 
a little unstable. I think that's what Catriona also said. I'm not sure what the weather is going to bring. I'm really happy to be invited to, to participate, to share um, with you on the series. Um, I've, I wear lots of hats and the hat that I'm mostly going to wear today is my, um, my teacher researcher hat. So I work um, at the University of Edinburgh uh, where I've been for a frighteningly long time now, 14 years, um, as well as doing creative things. And I'm going to be running a course at the University of Edinburgh in their new Futures Institute next year called um, for master's students called um, Story Roots to Sustainable Futures. So I've been doing a lot of thinking in planning this course. So I'm going to give you kind of like a half hour taster of, of what I'm thinking about, what I'm gonna be talking to students about next year. The course will start next year. Um, so, so obviously it's, it's a big course and I'm gonna try and, and give you a few <laughs> things to think about. Please slow me down if you want me to slow down explain something further, um, ask a question. I'm happy to take questions as we go along. And there's a few areas where, a few points where I want to stop and, um, and have a wee discussion. Um, so yes, that's, that's me. I also feel like I should, um, I'm not sure if you've come across this book, but um, myself and colleague, Alison Galbraith, who's a full-time storyteller, and pull this together. And the foreword of the book also shares some of the things, an introduction to some things I'm gonna talk about. So I'm going to be a social scientist today um, and try and give you a really mini, the social sciences of story, how social scientists are thinking about stories right now and why that might be useful for those of us who wanna use stories for social change what, what might be some useful things we can take from, from the social sciences. So, um, there we go. Oh, I can still see you. Good to see some of you. So just, I'm happy for you to just unmute yourselves um, if you wanna ask a question, because I won't be able to see all of you. I'm presenting. Can I do this? Present that. Yes. Okay. Can everybody see that? Well, all right. It's all good. All good. Um, so the first thing that I want to start off with, so my area of research has been for almost 20 years now, how do stories help us with ethical decision making around, particularly around environment and sustainability? Um, so I've been doing research. I started out my research with written stories, so memoirs. Um, so looking at the kinds of um, memoirs that were be co being called ecological memoirs or ecological writing at the beginning of the century. There was a whole flourishing of that kind of writing, um, both here and where I was based before in Canada and in the US. Um, so people like Roger Deakin, um, a lot of writers in the, in the States and Canada that I was looking at were writing about themselves in nature. And that's, that hasn't gone away. We still, I mean, there's whole sections in, in bookstores now of these kind of nature memoirs, myself and nature. And often they're quite, they're about healing, healing my depression through watching the swifts fly and things like that. So this is a big change in, in, the kinds of books that were getting written and published around nature, because before we were always writing about nature as separate from the person and often the, the writer would, wouldn't even be in there. And so I started with that, got interested in performance storytelling back in Canada um, from a friend of mine. Um, and also I've done research here, even on some gra a graphic novel project that the Scottish Book Trust put together about John Muir and looking at how that helps children think about the environment and how it even shifts children's values. And um, so, so that's the kind of research that I've been doing. 
Um, but I'm part of a bigger trend in universities since probably the late 1980s, which was this I, coming back to the arts in the universities. Um, and psychologists and neuroscientists actually um, finding out things that we've always known, which is that the arts matter, that stories matter, and that actually when we're making decisions, we're usually thinking with stories, not with principles. So there is, you know, there is a big trend in Western thinking away from stories and towards scientific, rational, technological thinking. Um, and that's the way education kind of moved and people wanted to think about society in the same kind of technical, rational ways, et cetera, et cetera. But in the late 20th century, things that were coming out of psychology and neuroscience were kind of saying, well, that's all very well. But actually, if you look at people's brains, when they're making decisions, when you're asking them to make small decisions or big ethical decisions, it's those parts of the brain that pay attention to stories that are, that are flashing in the MRIs, basically. Um, and so people are not necessarily making choices based on those logical, rational, um, technical kinds of knowledge, like, like the bullet point, like the science of climate change, et cetera, um, that might inform their thinking um, and still useful. We shouldn't get rid of that. But the decision-making is usually people drawing on stories that they know, stories that they've heard, story patterns that are um, common and shared within their social context. Um, and so if the scientific information doesn't match with that, then the scientific information doesn't really get acted on. And I think we can see that in our world today. So this is not necessarily a good, <laughs> it's not necessarily always a good thing and stories can be used in many different ways. So that's kind of the first thing. Stories are not just good, stories are tools and our narrative rationality, our narrative ways of thinking, which are so core to making decisions and to our identities and to our group identities, those are very important, but they can easily be manipulated. So that's just a little picture of Aristotle because Aristotle, even way back then, Aristotle was writing about how we need more than, we need to pay attention to for a good society, we need more than just technical rationality. We need to develop human beings in all of their different ways of reasoning and thinking, um, including something he called phronesis, which he thought was core to citizenship, and that some social scientists at the end of the 20th century started relating to narrative. So we develop our ability to be good citizens through stories and through becoming good with stories and good at thinking with stories. And, and part of that is not being um, manipulated by stories. So um, some psychologists <clears throat> and sociologists started to argue that actually who we think we are. So who I think I am as a let who I represent myself as to you is all about stories and storytelling. So that when I develop a sense of who I am, um, I'm drawing on the stories that I want to tell about myself and do tell about myself, but I'm also limited in that by the stories that people, that other people tell about me and about people like me. So we have some power to shape our own story, but other people also shape that story, you know, starting from our parents, from when we're in the womb, they will have stories about us. We're born into our family stories. We're born into our community stories. We're born into our society stories. So we don't have carte blanche to tell the story of who we are. And, and in fact, we can't even understand who we are outside of those those bigger community stories that we're a part of. So this I think is really important when we start to think about stories and social change. 
So we, we can only think about ourselves and what we want to do and what might be the right thing to do within the boundaries of the stories that we are a part of, that we have access to, that we know about. And I'm just gonna go through this slide and then have a little pause. So I've sometimes call this story soup. So here I am, or here you are, and you're in the story soup, and there's the stories you tell about yourself, the stories others tell about you, but there's always alternative stories around. Uh, and sorry, and the big egg here is the stories that dominate the context you're in, the stories that most people know, the stories that get the most airtime, and the stories that are taught in schools, et cetera. That is, those are the big dominant stories. But even, there are even alternative stories to that. And all of us know that here in this group, we're all gathered together because we know and we want other stories to live by because the stories that are dominating our communities and our societies are leading ourselves and our leaders and our, re our you know, researchers or scientists, the stories that dominate Western society are obviously leading us towards complete destruction. So um, finding those alternative stories, making them available to people, bringing them into the context and trying to challenge the dominant stories. That in a sense is the job of a story activist um, in some ways. So I'm just going to stop sharing for this minute and just so I can see you all again. So I want to ask you, you know, does that resonate? And if so, what do you think are some of the dominant stories that we really need to challenge? How would you phrase some of those dominant stories? Anybody wants to take a stab at it. <clears throat> I, I was just going to say that I think that was a very clear way of explaining the story soup. So thank you very much. Um, and I think one of the things, this is my age that's informing this, but one of the things has been the um how quickly the stories that we tell ourselves have changed over the last sort of 40 years and I'm thinking particularly about climate change just now and the kind of dominant narratives and how quickly they're changing and shaping and um, how that can be quite challenging for you know you've got then got I mean possibly intergenerational tension because the stories that you're hearing as a younger person are very different from the stories that you grew up with as an, an older person it's a, maybe about how a little bit more exploring about how to work with that and how to um, blend those different experiences and those different narratives together. I'm just conscious that we're maybe living through a time where stories and narratives are changing more quickly than they have done for hundreds of years previously. And, and we as social beings, how do we adapt to that? Yeah, okay, that's that's quite interesting, that idea of, of change and of the stresses of change. And yeah, if we think how closely ourselves, our sense of who we are is tied up with the stories that we're a part of. We can see how quickly changing stories can feel like something that's hitting right here and can lead to people being quite afraid um, or upset or angry and wanting to hold on to the old stories that gave them a sense of identity. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, yeah. Joy's got a hand up. Oh. Yeah, I was thinking of the the real importance of stories of where people have done things differently and how uh, powerful it is to share these kinds of stories um, and how they inspire us to to sort of create different narratives and to believe that other things are possible. So for me, that's that's like a really big focus. Yeah. But I think it's really useful that, you know, how you've described that context, that's allowed me to see why. So that's helpful, thank you. Katriona's got a hand up as well. Um, hi, I thought that was really, really interesting what you said. I think it's wonderful, I was desperately trying to take notes and things. Um, I actually realised that I'm involved in memoirs with other women of my age. Um, we're mostly in our 70s, so, and I think the fear is that our, our experience will vanish, that we've got to somehow record it. 
uh, before we die. But on the other hand, I mean, for instance, I got someone come out September next week who's going to be doing workshops about Greenham Common. I, I don't know if people know what Greenham Common is, but um, it, 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 she's a woman who lived there for, for many years to this um, American base, uh, nuclear base. And um, the feeling is that this will vanish and that there's something of value. But then again, um, especially for some women of my generation, our, our story is not maybe my personal story, but many women's stories is being challenged and in an ex to an extent even demonized. And um, that is very painful and difficult. So I do realize to what you were saying, uh, Joy, you know, that stories change. And is, is, is our stories of any value? Do we need to change our stories because younger people are going to have a different story? And, and can you pass on a story? Or do people have to make their own stories? It, it seems difficult to pass things on. There's a really interesting um, project that maybe I will pass on to, to uh, Kashka, to Katriona. Um, I came across a, a project that was done in Australia that was very much about this idea of narrative social change, but about intergenerational narrative um, social change and, and working together and sharing between um, people who had been involved for decades and younger people coming into, um, I think it was specifically XR, um, and about how using story to um, develop resilience amongst both of those groups. So that might be really interesting. I wasn't part of this study, but I can, um, if Casca makes a note of that, I, I can find that paper and share that with you because it's quite an interesting project and actually very actively worked with some of the ideas that I'm talking about now. So I think the share, it is very important. Um, the sharing of stories across generations can be really important and regenerative and um, resilience building for everybody. Um, and I think the, the loss of stories. So I would say, um, yeah, I would say in some senses, the Greenham, you know, these, these important stories of things that have happened in the past need to be kept alive. I don't think, I would never argue that stories have to be passed over for the, the new generation. And I think partly stories can be quite, quite adaptable and flexible and it's about telling the story for, for others. Um, however those others are. And that's going to just, I'm going to jump back to my presentation. Um, I'm just seeing in the, in the chat here. Um, yeah, so three st stories. So some stories might have changed and certainly I think counterculture stories and activist stories have, poss have possibly changed. But I think that there is still, which I'm seeing in the chat represented, very strong dominant narratives that don't shift very much and haven't shifted for a few hundred years probably they've adapted and become taken on slightly new meanings as technology has changed but the idea that technology is going to rescue us um, the idea that joanna's put up there that humans are by nature greedy and conflict ridden and therefore there's nothing that can be done. This is just human nature, et cetera. And the idea of progress, nobody's used that word progress, but that story of progress has been dominant in Western society for at least 500 years and changes um, ever so slightly, but still is ever present um, in our lives. And I think translates often at the individual scale to the idea that the individual has to progress. And what that progress means is, is still that getting the job, getting the raise, you know, maybe, maybe not a job anymore, but you're, you're an entrepreneur and you're going to progress as an entrepreneur and you'll be making three, you know, six figures in five years. And if you just take this course, you'll be doing all of that. That narrative is still broadly in society and still dominating our sense of ourselves and our self-worth quite a bit, I, I would argue. So coming back to sharing this. All right, so um, actually I'm just gonna skip, I'll, I'll come back to that in a second. Um, 
Arthur Frank is somebody who works on healthcare reform, but I think a lot of his arguments are quite similar. Um, he wants healthcare to be reformed into a more caring environment. And I think that's a big thing within climate change and community activism. We want more caring too. Um, and he's, again, somebody who's been working on stories for quite a few decades. Um, and this one way he has of looking at, I've found really useful for myself. And that is basically the three-step program for narrative, for story activism or narrative acti activism. So first of all is, and they're not necessarily linear. So, you know, you can work on any one of these, but the, the one I've got up here is, is this, how do you help people, including ourselves, detach from dominant stories? Okay, so how, do, and, and that includes even helping people recognize that these are stories. Stories are incredibly powerful, but once you recognize that something is a story, then that opens up some room for change, for movement, because we, we all know how to tell a story and we all know how to tell a different story. So once we recognize that something is a story um, and not necessarily a rigid truth that's unbendable, um, then there's room for new stories to come in. So the, the second strategy is excavating alternative stories. Um, and so I think this ties into some of the things. So Katriana, that you were saying, you know, the Greenham Common story is an alternative story. It's an alternative to the, the dominant stories of society. It has so much to say about what activism can achieve, about, um, about the power of, of coming together and determination and all of these sorts of things and a different set of values from those values of progress and dominance. So that would very much be an alternative story. And I think, um, Catherine, a lot of the things that you were saying are still quite alternative stories. So those alternative stories might be changing and shifting, but none of them have really managed to become the dominant stories. Um, in our society. And I think there's probably value in a lot of those alternative stories. And then the third, the third part of this strategy from Arthur Frank is the idea of amplifying counter stories. So once, once we have these alternative stories, identifying those stories that are really going to be useful and are embodying and um, including the values that we want um, and pointing towards a future that we want, how do we go ahead and amplify those? So all of these things involve very different practical activities, right? I think podcasting is, is one way of amplifying that we have now with technology now that wasn't available really even 10 years ago. Um, and obviously there were podcasters 10 years ago, but it wasn't quite the movement it is now and it was harder to get into, et cetera. So, Podcasting represents a way to amplify counter stories. Talking to people who don't normally get airtime, whether it's at a community scale or a broader scale, is one way of bringing out those stories that we don't normally get to hear. And um, this one, the detaching from dominant stories, I think is, is a really interesting one that's maybe a little more complicated to, to get people to think about. Um, and is more of a dialogical. So Arthur Frank's actually drawing on some practices from psychotherapy in doing this. Psychotherapy can in many ways be understood as somebody with a story that doesn't work for them, coming to a therapist who helps them get rid of the story that doesn't work and tell a new story about them. So most forms of talk therapy can be understood uh, it, with that kind of analogy. Um, and so he actually draws on some of those ideas of just helping people point out that that story isn't working for them and helping people point out that there's, if they think about other experiences, they can tell other stories. So the one that's really quite easy is that human beings are by nature horrible, right? Greedy, awful people. But you can sit down with somebody and say, well, yeah, that's a, that's, that might be a story you hold, but surely you can think 
of, you know, even one time when that wasn't the case, something where somebody treated you kindly or did something altruistically. And just having one of those things then chips open a bit of space in that dominant narrative. So I'm going to jump to, sorry, that picture didn't turn out very well. Hilde, Hilde Lindemann Nelson is a philosopher, American philosopher, who's not very well known outside of small circles, but she's really been interested in this idea of a counter story. And she mostly works um, around gender, stories of gender, but the, the same thing is applicable, I think, to any way of wanting to break out of a dominant story. So she has done some thinking about how do we dismantle those big dominant meta narratives and how do we get those alternative stories to be more widely accepted through society? So assuming that we want our stories of a better, more caring, more equitable future, um, where there's room for other than human animals and other organisms and the climate is cooling down, et cetera, then we don't want to just be talking to ourselves, right? There's a, there's a really good place for talking to that whole thing of, of preaching to the converted. There's a really good and important role that that plays and we should never not do that or feel like we're not doing anything just because everybody who shows up already has those values. Because what's happening when we're talking to people who already has the, have those values is we're reinforcing our, those alternative stories. We're building a place in which those alternative stories are dominant and we can tell about it, we can tell our own selves, we can shape our identities according to those alternative stories. So it is really, really important that we do preach to the converted, as we say. But if we want to bring more people into these stories, then some of the, the work of Nelson can be really helpful here. Um, and she, she kind of works on two sides. She talks about dismantling the meta narratives or challenging them, which can be that detaching from the dominant story. So she's always looking for cracks, you know? So like I said, finding an experience in which people have not acted out of greed can, can be wedged in and crack that story open a little bit more that human beings are just awful, right? So that's, that's directly kind of cracking that open. And so a story about human beings acting in a kind and altruistic way would be an alternative story that's being wedged in to break, out, break open that dominant story. Um, so cracks, looking for cracks and actively trying to find a story that, that can be wedged into a crack, I think is a useful um, thing to do. I can see things are popping onto the chat, but from my screen, I can't actually see what they are. It's okay. I think people are just sharing resources. So I'll share Okay, them. cool. Yeah. No, so if no there's a question, just pop that up. Um, and also looking at cracks between those big stories. So that's, that's one strategy. The other thing that she talks about is again, I think for me, what's really interesting about narrative sociology is how much it connects the individual to broader society and how important an in, the stories an individual holds become to social change. So it's really, um, brings a way of thinking to that idea of the, the personal is the political. So she also argues that the first thing that needs to happen for an alternative story to become a counter story is for people to live it. So even if it's a small number of people living that alternative story and, and sharing that alternative story, that is the seed from which those, those stories can start to spread. So, there is dissemination in terms of, you know, what gets put on Netflix and everybody watches, those ones reach way more people. But she also is quite optimistic about that, you know, small groups of people living an alternative story and all of the connection that small group of people have to expanding and expanding as well. 
disseminating that way. So that would be the amplifying. So we can all amplify in our own areas. Um, obviously, the more the the more people who can hear our stories, the better. Um, in terms of this final one, but really it has more to do with the authenticity with which somebody shares a story. And um, that's really, really important. So some of that authenticity gets lost when it becomes, um, becomes something that is, you know, a Netflix flavor of the day. I think I'm starting to ramble. And so I just had a couple more things I wanted to say, and then I think I'm at the end. So this is very interesting. Um, so story within indigenous cultures that are still managing to survive colonialism, um, story remains much more powerful and important in a direct personal way than within Western society where our stories are quite commercialized and watered down and we're not necessarily so aware of what they're doing to us on a day-to-day -day basis. I'm not gonna read this, but I, I'm happy to share the slides. So a very interesting study that was done in the early 90s um, of, um, oh, what tribe was it? I cannot remember the tribe for life of me today. Usually I do. Anyways, it was a study of how stories were working in this particular tribe still, where stories were very much attached to landscape. And I think in Scotland, we still have some of that landscape associated folk folklore and that other places maybe don't have as much of anymore in Europe. Um, but it's a very visceral explanation of what happens when somebody tells a specific story. So we could say an alternative story as kind of story medicine for a person who is who strayed off of the, the community path, the moral path for that particular community. And how when that story is told and that story is told well, it hits the person who's listening to it and they have to go away and, and, and let the story do its work for a couple of days or more maybe. And after that, they're forever changed. So it's a really nice way of thinking about story um, in a context in which story is still thought and talked about like that. And then the other quotation that I like to share is from Ursula Le Guin, who was very much a, a story activist. Um, she mostly through her novels, but all of her novels were these kind of explorations of different ways of organizing society and thinking about the world. Um, and I love this quote. So I'm gonna indulge myself and read it to you. And then I think my time is up. So Le Guin wrote, it is the story that makes a difference. It is the story that hid my humanity from me. The story the mammoth hunters told about bashing, thrusting, raping, killing about the hero, the killer story. It sometimes seems that that story is approaching its end. Lest there be no more telling of stories at all, some of us out here in the wild oats amid the alien corn think we'd better start telling another one, which maybe people can go on with when the old one's finished. Maybe. The trouble is we've all let ourselves become part of the killer story. And so we may get finished along with it. Hence, it is with a certain feeling of urgency that I seek the nature subject words of the other story, the untold one, the life story. So hopefully I didn't try to cram too much into half an hour, which is sometimes my problem. Um, and hopefully some of that lands and connects. I think the one final thing I wanna say which I didn't put in these slides, but I'm thinking now I should have put in, is within this idea of, of story and the self, I'll just go quickly back to here, there's this concept of intelligibility, which is really important. So we can own, we want to be understood. Human beings are desperate to be understood, to be to be part of community and not being understood is something that really um, is makes people very unhappy and um, affects mental health, etc. And so we 
we are always telling stories in a way that we assume other people will understand. Right? It's very difficult for us to tell stories in a context where we think the story that we're telling is not going to be understood because then we won't be understood. And so this is partly what the why this this context is has so much strength, right? So we all assume we can assume everybody in Western society knows the story of progress. And so we can be understood by framing our experience um, in terms of wanting to get ahead, right? We know we will be understood like this. Whereas telling a story of making quite a different choice about the main values that we're going to structure our life around that might go against getting ahead, it can feel very risky again, because our self, are very, we're so tangled up in ourself and our self worth that to tell a story and to see somebody not understand or look at us blankly is something that is difficult for humans to overcome being social animals. And that's partly where the dominance of these big stories continue to be dominant because we assume they're shared. And so a shared story makes us intelligible, makes us acceptable to the other. And alternative stories don't always do that, which is why that sharing of stories amongst people who share the same values is really helpful because it strengthens our sense of self-worth, our resilience, et cetera, um, and why it's difficult to tell those stories in a context in which you believe consciously or subconsciously your audience isn't going to understand you. Um, so yeah, now I will definitely Oh, Thanks for that. It, it's amazing. I was writing notes like 100 miles an hour. Um, um, lots and lots of ideas in there. Uh, I think we've got, um, we, it's 10 minutes till two, so we'll spend maybe eight minutes of that um, for, uh, for questions, if anybody's got questions. Yeah, I just want to answer there to Andy, the idea of, of paradigms. Yeah, so Meta narratives, paradigms, worldviews, those are some of the words that get used for those dominant ideas about what the world is about. I like to use meta narrative because that concept of narrative for me um, helps to make it seem more approachable and opens up, well, where do we intervene? Um, Whereas the ideas about paradigm are, are often just one paradigm rises to replace another paradigm, but there's not a huge um, amount of, yeah. Um, worldview also really, really interesting um, how sometimes the discussions about worldview and, and narrative overlap. And um, sorry, I'm having a brain tired brain syndrome to take, I can't remember anything. Um, the system theorist who writes about, who wrote about worldview, what is her name? Um, anyways, she, there's some interesting connections in her thinking about how to intervene in systems change and, parad and worldviews and stories, but I can't remember her name at the moment. We can share if you remember after the thing. I'll, I'll include it in the in the email follow up email. <laughs> Any other questions? Danella Meadows. That's who I meant. Very interesting thinker. One of the pioneers of sort of mid, mid to late 20th century system thinker, thinking, um, organic farmer, no longer, no longer on the planet, unfortunately, but um, her writings are all collected on a website and there's really interesting stuff. That's going away from the narrative. There's only a tiny tie there, but Danella Meadows um, and her um, points of shifting a system really, really useful. Another kind of way into thinking about system, systems change, social change, um, and where are the, the weak points in a system where you can do the, make the most change for the least effort. Highly recommend her work. Yes, um, Katie. 
Hey, I missed the first 15 minutes or so, so I have to apologize for that, um, but really enjoyed what I did here. Um, yeah, I found it really fascinating and useful. But um, I'm curious to know specifically when it comes to podcasts, um, why you think podcasting as a medium might be good for um, the steps you were talking about, kind of deconstructing the dominant narrative, excavating alternate narratives. Um, and then also how it might be possible, or if it is possible with something like podcasting to reach beyond those who are already receptive to those um, alternative narratives, if that is possible. Yeah, I think podcasting has so much potential and achieves so much in terms of amplifying stories, in terms of spreading stories beyond beyond borders, beyond a small number of people, um, et cetera. Um, stories of including dominant narratives. I mean, there's lots of podcasts that are really great for reinforcing dominant narratives. So um, that I see podcasts as, as great for that third part, that, that amplifying. And the, um, the content of the podcast can engage with the other things quite, quite well. Um, and so I know more about Casca's podcasting Casca does where she goes and, and gets people to share their stories and things like that. Those are so often alternative stories that aren't getting heard. Um, and I think so where they can help bring in different listeners, again, just thinking about um, the, the multiple connections to one person's story, you know, so, so people who are in Tayport, for example, and say the podcast is going to have somebody from Tayport speaking, people who know the person who's speaking and are from Tayport might tune in because, hey, it's about Tayport and how often do you get to listen to something about Tayport? So I think you probably do end up getting people who aren't commonly listening to the alternative story joining in because they're finding some other connection. Um, and you know, the people who, think, who do a lot of thinking about this and have achieved a lot are people in marketing, right? So, you know, thinking through how you, you market your story and marketing is so much about storytelling. And again, connects to this, all of these technologies and techniques are not in themselves inherently radical or inherently revolutionary or inherently good. Um, it's just, they can be used by whomever for whatever purposes. Um, and so I do think it, it comes back to how you're marketing, what is the broader story. Um, and if you do it well and people enjoy listening to it, then hopefully you're hooking people in through, through skill and talent and, and all that sort of thing. And they'll tune in next week, even though the next person isn't from Tayport, they're from somewhere else, but they enjoyed that so much. So yeah, I'm, podcasting puts puts the ability to um, broadcast into a broader range of people's hands, really. But it is, it's in many ways, just, it's the same technology as how we use it. So hopefully that helps. Um, Ruth is asking for recommendations of podcasts that have effectively changed behavior and climate change. Uh, it's probably quite hard to pinpoint that, but we do have a list on our website of podcasts from Scotland that are working in this field. Um, Farmarama, I think, which is not necessarily Scotland-based and which Katie uh, works with, is, for, is a very good example, I think, because it's about regener regenerative agriculture. Um, and I think that um, the fact that it's been long running and it's got expanding listenership um, proves that it's had an impact. Um, and so, so it's linked to climate, climate action. But we're hoping with 1,000 Better Stories podcast also to showcase. I was I was listening to you, Alette, and I was going, this is exactly what we're doing. There's three steps. We're actually trying to detach from the, work out what the dominant narratives are, what we want to find the examples yeah. of this um, future examples, lived examples of the stories that we want to tell and showcase them and amplify them through through all the channels, not just podcasts. So as you say, technology doesn't really matter, but as long as you've got so many, as many voices as possible, the diversity of voices embedded in communities, because as you say, people will come and listen to the story 
and it's going to be much more relevant to the people from the community I think. Yeah I'm sure all of you are doing this and, and what I've presented is, is nothing new I hope it just gives you a language and a different way of thinking about it because we all do this instinctively you know we're all storytellers humans are quite good at storytelling and we do it all the time but hopefully this helps again just be slightly more conscious um, and hopefully then slightly more effective um, and can I do one tiny plug Casca so I'm currently doing a little piece of research where I'm hoping to do um, to, to get input from a bunch of people diverse people who are working with story and sustainability um, and Casca and Joanna are are working on this too so if you think you might have time to contribute to um, to our project or you can use my email address for any reason but please reach out and um, I think Katie you might be on the list already <laughs> I don't have your email directly. Um, please reach out or if you have any questions or want to talk to me about any of this. Better unmute myself. This is <laughs> um, right. I think we need to wrap up now because it's one minute to go. Um, I, I would like to thank Alette so much for coming and sharing um, this vision with us. And I love the idea of a story activist. I'm going to start referring to myself as story activist. So lots of really interesting language as well and concepts. Um, so thanks a lot. And uh, if you feel like staying back a couple of minutes, uh, maybe you could share um, one thing that you will take away from this session um, that you will use in your own practice, perhaps in the chat, just so that um, maybe to, to you know, put it in your in your head and make sure that you actually will <laughs> have a takeaway from it. Um, that would be really useful. And I will send an email out with uh, all the resources we shared in the chat. Um, um, Alette, you said you're happy to share the slides as well. So we can um, attach that and um, all the um, upcoming training and storytelling workshops as well. Um, so it's all going to be out there. Um, right. I think that's it. Thank you everybody for coming. Ooh, identity is a story activist. This is it. <laughs> Inspiration. Arthur Frank's three steps. I'm just going to stop recording now because we don't need